Now, from the KC24 studios, The Big Tell, 10 short films from 10 Valley filmmakers, inspiring local stories throughout our valley. Presented by the James B. McClatchy Foundation in partnership with Central Valley Community Foundation and CMAC. The Big Tell Showcase starts now. Welcome to the 2022 Big Tell Showcase. I am Emily Irwin, host of Central Valley Today here on KC24. And I'm Ashley Swearingen, former mayor of Fresno and CEO of the Central Valley Community Foundation. We are here today to celebrate our Central Valley with a collection of 10 captivating five minute mini documentary films known as the Big Tell Showcase. Each spring, the Central Valley Community Foundation invites Valley filmmakers of every experience level to submit their big idea for a documentary for a lesser known Central Valley story. And then our judges carefully select 10 ideas and the 10 winning filmmakers receive a $5,000 grant to create their films. Along with production funding, the 10 filmmakers receive a mentorship with Emmy nominated documentarian Sasha Brown Rice, who guides them along the filmmaking process. These filmmakers also receive a membership to the Community Media Access Center, providing access to all types of film equipment and resources. This showcase is as diverse in subject as the vast Central Valley. These stories represent communities throughout the region. The filmmakers are also diverse in background and ethnicity, age, and filmmaking experience. Throughout the showcase, we'll take a dive into these films and speak to each one of the filmmakers about their experience with the filmmaking process. Now, none of this would have been possible without our friends at CMAC. Now, a few words from the executive director, Brian Harley. We had over 100 submissions this year, and I was struck by just how many great stories are out there. It was so difficult to narrow it down to just 10 winners. The Central Valley region is home to so many unique and vibrant stories that represent the richness and diversity of our amazing people and places. CMAC's mission is to empower people to tell their story by providing access to media tools and training. We believe that everyone has a story to tell and everyone deserves to be seen, heard, and recognized. Sharing these stories helps create a more connected community with people who are informed and engaged with what's happening and are inspired to make their home an even better place. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, the James B. McClatchy Foundation, for funding this project and lifting up these amazing stories. Now a few words from the CEO, Priscilla Enriquez. There's a lot of richness in the stories that are not told. And I think through filmmaking, you actually get to see a lot more and you, you it, it fosters this feeling of connection uh, to the people that are portrayed, to the stories that are being told. Um, I think anyone, regardless of you know where you come from, your background, you're going to relate to any of these stories just because they're wonderfully rich and, um, and they're really uh, heartwarming. This first film explores the language of the Southern Miwok people. We learn about people indigenous to Mariposa County and Yosemite. There's three native speakers left. In our language is highly endangered. Jolak. Jolak. And that's why we got to keep it going. Machuxasu, Kanya no Yahenti Irene, Angel Vasquez. I'm Southern Sierra Miwok and also Mon Lake Paiute. I grew up in Mariposa, California. The Southern Sierra Miwok are people who are native to the Sierra Nevadas from the area known as Mariposa and Yosemite. We have lived here a long time. We're descendants of the Awanichi people. Awa and Southern Sierra Miwok means mouth, the people of the gaping mouth. Well, the Southern Sierra Miwok has been in this area, basically Mariposa County, for thousands of years. Some say that it came from the Great Basin, 
over the Sierras. And that's kind of based on basketry techniques. Language revitalization is super important because it helps me know who I am, feel proud of who I am. It also helps me know about my environment, my surroundings, and how people just thought about the natural world and related to things like animals and how their natural sounds sometimes describe the actual word for them, like woodpecker, which is palatata. So it's actually onomatopoeia mimicking the, uh, the bird picking against the tree. An owl is hukumi, hukumi. So much of our language offers the ability the understandings of how our people relate to this world offers insights into our environment. Everywhere around the world, languages, cultures, diversities, decreasing. Because our language was never written down. It was verbally. The government worked so hard to assimilate us with multiple generations of boarding schools. A lot of our language has been lost. That was only two generations ago, and yet they can't put funds towards us keeping it alive. I've actively made language materials. I've worked hard on those things. A lot of those things have burned up. I tried to make a little language book about plants and animals and their uses. I printed a bunch of them out for my relatives and hopes that all our people could look through it and keep it living. Our tribe with the Southern Sierra Miwok Nation are non-friendly recognized and with that lack of acknowledgement comes the inability to apply for federal grants reserved for federally recognized tribes so that they can work towards preserving their languages. California has had one tribe in 38 years that has gone through the entire process and became a federally recognized tribe. So our tribe submitted an application in 1982. It would be just neat to see more and more of our people feeling empowered, being able to say a prayer, and being able to understand the elders who just connects you to your ancestors. Language is healing. Chutu. I do chutu. Iwi. It's all good now. That's why we have to keep our knowledge going so our children will know what happened to our people how they were conquered, how their land was taken away. Uh, it's a language of Yosemite, and you would think there would be more effort towards keeping it alive. So joining us now is filmmaker Jennifer Robin, here for a second time with me, and your film is called Endangered Language. How do we motivate people to learn these languages? Well, and that's part of the thing. Um, I applied for the Big Tell, um, doing life, the Oak Fire hit, and papoom. So I found out Monday, a few days after the Oak Fire, that I have to now ask people to talk to me when they lost homes. We, we touch on the video on what materials were lost, you know, things that were out of print. And, you know, you have, she actually ended up getting a book from Brazil because that was the only place in this random bookstore that had um, the Miwok dictionary. So it, it's hard to motivate kids in general. So that's like a like five part series we can do, like tasers. We do all, all curriculum. <laughs> you know? And like you said, starting young. And in this video, we, we give names of Yosemite landmarks in language. And for some reason, those stick. So there's an interactive aspect to the language, slowing down enough to know what a woodpecker is in this region, you know, are just little things start to get your brain excited about wanting to observe more. It is, it is important, like we talk about in the film, just simple sentences. How are you? Talking about the weather, pointing at a deer or a raccoon, 
those things make a big difference and kind of keep keep you enthusiastic about your capability of, of absorbing that language. How one man overcame a rare autoimmune disorder while pursuing his passion for music. We continue the Big Tell Showcase after this. What I love about CMAC. What I love about CMAC. What I love about CMAC is that they provide me with the knowledge. The equipment. The space. To express myself. To amplify my voice. To share my story. My story. Mi historia. Kekudane. My story. Wadakushu. My story. Go to cmac.tv slash my story to learn more. Now, from the KC24 Studios, The Big Tell. 10 short films from 10 Valley filmmakers. Inspiring local stories throughout our valley. Presented by the James B. McClatchy Foundations in partnership with Central Valley Community Foundation and CMAC. This is The Big Tell. Welcome back to the Big Tell Showcase. Our next film shadows a Dainuba musician whose passion for music has kept him strong throughout his many hardships in life. Let's take a look. It was a day after a session I had. I was recording a, a song that I had put out back then, and I just wanted to finish up some guitar. I had my guitar with me, and while my friend was mixing, just pressing down on the strings, it just, it hurt. My fingers were numb, but it hurt at the same time. I couldn't form a chord shape, and that's when it started to worry me a little bit more. With GBS, a lot of people just think it's the numbness. You might be sitting still, but your heart rate's over 120. <laughs> and I was kind of scared to get the IV put into me, and I blacked out. They had to almost use a defibrillator on me, but all I remember coming back to was just a pounding on my chest, and it was the doctor just literally punching my chest to get my heart back up. So I was in the hospital for about a week and a half until I was admitted into a rehab center. In that uh, rehab center, they had a chapel and there was a piano in there and I was with my mom and I had her wheel me to, the, to that chapel. She had to open the, the top of the piano and I had no idea what I wanted to play, but I remembered a friend and I had made a song that really <laughs> spoke to me at that moment. And I attempted to play it, and when I couldn't even make the chord shape and press down on the keys, I kind of just broke down and started crying. The one thing that I love to do every day, that I look forward to every day, I couldn't do anymore. And that's what broke me. My grandma's name was uh, Betty Holmes. She was a huge part of my recovery process because when she was told she had cancer, the first time doctor said it was only six months. She only had six months. But three years later, <laughs> about, about three years later, um, she was still there. It was when my dad told me, this little old woman is too stubborn to die. That stuck around with me going through what I went through where my dad told me the same thing. I'm too, st I'm too stubborn to let it get to me. I pushed myself to get up out of my bed, out of my wheelchair, and a doctor saw me, and she had told me, oh, you're walking around right now. And I'm like, yeah, it's still pretty hard, but you know, I have my walker, I'm pushing myself to do it. And she's like, you're stubborn, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah, it's, I get it from my grandma. And she's like, you'll be fine. Just give it a couple months you'll be back to your old self. My grandma was too stubborn to literally let a stroke and full-on cancer <laughs> kill her. <laughs> and that stays with me even after me getting sick. It stays with me in different parts of my life. So it actually took me a while to become creative again. <laughs> it was actually 
me waiting to buy a new guitar because I thought I owed it to myself. After what I went through, I'm gonna buy myself a brand new guitar. A new guitar sitting in my hands. I'm gonna play it. So I strummed. I played the first song I ever learned how to play was Bulls on Parade by Rage Against the Machine. And it felt good to get a guitar back in my hands and play. Juxtaposed to me not being able to play my own song on piano, I was able to finish a full song. It felt that I couldn't lose. It felt so natural to do. And it felt fitting because the first song I learned. It just felt like the first time I played guitar all over again. I feel like this experience has impacted my music career in a very positive way, actually. <laughs> With getting sick, that really put it all into perspective to where there's no way that I'm not gonna not let myself get to my goals. My end game is to do what I want, is to make music for a living. Since then, a lot of amazing stuff has happened and I don't think I've changed anything from that point on. So joining us now is filmmaker Jason Duong. Mm -hmm. So how did you land on this story for The Big Tell? So I met my friend Jeffrey on set. We're uh, shooting a short film and then I think I overheard him telling someone else his story. Uh -huh. And so that's how I connected with him because like he was very open to just people he just met. And so I, I just figured like, oh, if it really is open, like, let's, let's have an interview with this. Yeah. I felt like there was a lot of care. I had to make sure in the details with this story, because mm -hmm. it's only five minutes. So yeah. it's like really, really hard. To, I had like, we interviewed for about an hour mm -hmm. and I had to cut it down to five minutes. So um, I just wanted to be like, very careful of how I represent him. Yeah. And make sure like it's still like all the emotions of him talking about because it's like a really hard part like time of his life. Yeah. And then you can hear it in his interview like he kind of breaks down a little bit. So I want to make sure we capture that too. Like how does it feel to like know the chords, uh -huh. like the placement, but you you just can't do it. Yeah. So then I I think only he could explain that to right. me. Like this project I mainly so there's one shoot where I had a lot of help and uh -huh. the, and the rest of it I just did completely by myself. So um, that really stretched me. Like I had to make sure everything's good. I had to run like two cameras by myself, run audio, and conduct the interview. <laughs> it was really stressful, but I got through it. Well, I cannot wait to see more stories from you, Jason Duong. Thank you so much for being here today. A top 10 ranked UFC fighter living here in the Central Valley. We share her story after this. Presented by the James B. McClatchy Foundations in partnership with Central Valley Community Foundation and CMAC. This is The Big Tell. Now, from the KC24 studios, The Big Tell. 10 short films from 10 Valley filmmakers. Inspiring local stories throughout our valley. Presented by the James B. McClatchy Foundations in partnership with Central Valley Community Foundation and CMAC. This is The Big Tell. Small town girl, big time noise, a quote that Marion lives by, a journey into one UFC fighter's life. Just imagine, take two people, you throw them in a cage, and it's locked from the outside. There's no way out unless you tap, nap, or jump over the cage. Felt like the movies when you're watching the gladiator. Everybody's cheering for them, and it's kind of surreal. I remember I was elbowing her in the face. I was like, I'm actually fighting somebody, and people are cheering me on to do it. My name is Marion Renault. I am a former UFC fighter. I am a former educator, a full-time mom, and a full-time coach. I was raised in Porterville, California, on the east side of town, and saw my mom and dad struggle a lot. But it wasn't until high school when I was like, I want to do something more. I want to be in the limelight as a track star, set records, be in the Olympics. That was my dream. I left to Long Beach State. I was on the track team on a Fulbright scholarship. 
and then my senior year, re-injured myself. I graduated and I just started working at a Enterprise Rent-A-Car and then I got pregnant. I was a single mother and I was barely making it. I came here to Visalia. I worked at Farmersville High School. I was their PE teacher. I had to pay car notes, I had to pay rent, I had to pay for daycare and then feed him and myself. There was a point where I was basically starving myself just to feed my son. Just being alone, doing things solo, and struggling for so long, you hit a low. I remember I was sitting on my futon, I turned on my TV. I seen Gina Carano and Chris Ibor. And I'm like, wait a minute, women are fighting? It snapped me out of whatever I was feeling at that moment, and it totally changed me. I woke up the next morning with a purpose. I want to start boxing. When I had my first fight, I was 29 years old. I just remember that Josh looked at me and he said, you need the win, you need the money. Do it for your son. And I went in there with a vengeance. I went to hold $300 that fight. I went right to the grocery store and I bought $300 worth of food. I did some local fights here in the area and all of a sudden, there's female fighters in the UFC. So they put up a ultimate fighting championship house. There was hundreds of women, and they were only picking 20. They're like, so you're 36 years old. And I was like, uh-oh. I had been cut and was pretty much just about ready to quit. I get a call from my coach. We have a fight for you. It's with the UFC, and I'm like, what? I got to Vegas, and everything was just so amazing to me. My eyes were wide open, and I was just taking in everything. The fans were coming up to you, asking for autographs, and I'm like, me? <laughs> I haven't even fought yet. They knew everybody on the card. To show up, I was just getting four grand. To win, I was getting four grand. More than I've ever had in my whole entire life at one time. This was my one shot to save money like I want to for my son's education. I just remember, don't let her hit you, you hit her first. The outcome was my hand raised. The students had set up posters all throughout the school congratulating me. I felt so extremely happy, like I had a purpose. Two weeks later, I get a call again. Hey, we have another fight for you. It's in Brazil. We get in the fight and I ran into one of her punches and the crowd is just losing their mind. They were chanting, you're gonna die, you're gonna die and she happened to just fall right into my triangle and she tapped and it was just silent. As a single parent who was struggling, oh, I can't do it, I have my kid, bring your kid. Let them see you working, help them help you. I'd get back on Sunday and that very Monday, I'd be back at work. The kids were just like, I couldn't believe I saw you on TV fighting. They always wanted to talk about it. I say, listen, you can be from a small town and make big noise. You don't have to just get stuck. Small town girl, big time noise. Joining us now is filmmaker Zach Green, and he brought along Jackie Schuster. In this film, how did you guys find this story, and uh, how did you go about starting it and getting in touch with people? What was that process like? Zach actually met Marion a few years ago. Um, he had to do some contracted filming with her for the UFC, and then we met her again when we were filming for Lamore High School. And she had talked about how she had never had someone tell her story before, and she wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the, the most interesting thing is this is a woman who is was still at the time a Farmersville PE teacher, uh -huh. but she was competing at the highest level in the UFC, and she was one of the like top 10 women in the UFC and fighting against the biggest names that you've ever heard of. Yeah. And so to me, that was just super intriguing. I didn't, you know... I didn't know what story we were going to tell from that other than she's a PE teacher and she's a yeah. UFC fighter at the same time like and she goes back and teaches PE on Monday. There's so many different branches that you could take with the storytelling yeah. like Zach was saying we didn't know that we were going to focus so much on what her life was like before fighting and how fighting really turned her life around for the better. We want it to resonate with people um, who are struggling who okay. are having a tough time that you know you can turn things around if you work hard enough. Um, we also wanted to resonate with people in the Central Valley. She 
always says, you know, you can be from a small town and still make big noise. And that's one of her biggest things that she wants, you know, for us to learn is that um, you don't have to just be stuck in one spot. Even if you live in a small town or in the Central Valley here, um, you can still do big things. An inside look at truck drivers' lives from farm to table. We'll be right back. Now from the KC24 studios, The Big Tell. 10 short films from 10 Valley filmmakers. Inspiring local stories throughout our valley. Presented by the James B. McClatchy Foundations in partnership with Central Valley Community Foundation and CMAC. This is The Big Tell. From farm to table, a look into the life of a truck driver. My full name is Luis Enrique Pulido. Everybody here knows me by Luis. I'm an owner operator of my own uh, trucking company. My name is Saib Jit Singh. I am a trucker, a photographer. It's like a big part of our community. A lot of people um, are into trucking. It's, I feel like it's become a part of culture. I always thought, you know, trucks and cars were cool, big into like automotives. I started as a company driver. I worked for many companies actually. I started uh, as a distributor. I started getting the hang of it of how dispatchers were doing their thing. It's definitely a family business. Uh, my dad does it, my brother did it before, my uncles, um, all my close friends, they're truckers. Um, it's a big part of our community. We do a lot of Texas lows to Washington, to Colorado, to uh, Wyoming, and, and other states, yeah. A lot of the times, you know, you'll be driving through Texas and, and it's raining. Well, in California, you know, it's 112 degrees, you know, outside. And, uh, you go to Washington and, again, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just beautiful scenarios, you know. Anywhere you go, man, it's, it's just beautiful stuff out there that you get to see every day, you know? Every day is something different. And uh, I feel like truckers are the unsung heroes, especially during the pandemic. Life wasn't easy, you know? Um, we didn't have access to a lot of places. We were the essential workers that didn't get much recognition, so um, I definitely wanna show respect to all the truckers who are out there putting in work and then deliver the things that were needed during the pandemic. And uh, there was a lot of shortage of things. And uh, these essential workers just kept going, man. I remember uh, it wasn't easy, but you know, we kept going. Somebody that is considering, uh, you know, taking, pursuing this career is have a lot of patience. Man. That's, you know, every day, like I said, you know, there's so many things out there you're you're going through, and, and you just pretty much have to be patient. I know the tough part of trucking is uh, being away from family, being away from home. Um, depending on where you drive to, you can be pretty far away from family for a few days. Sometimes people are out for months. They make a, you know, we make a huge sacrifice, I would say, you know. Um, we give up on a lot of little luxuries, you know, we give up on our, uh, we give up our bedroom, uh, you know, we get to sleep in that bunk. This is not bad. And then, uh, you know, e eating home, a fresh cooked meal at home, you know, we miss out on that unless you eat out every day at a restaurant. You know, that's not healthy either. Another thing I want to say is um, about trucking is that dangers are physical. Repercussions are physical. So let's say if you're working at an office job, you mess up. The worst thing that can happen is you can get fired um, or your boss is mad at you. Um, you have certain people that are, mad, um, you know, not happy with you. Um, with trucking, if you mess up and um, let's say you make a mistake on the road, that can cost someone their life. 
it can cost you your life. A lot of people um, kind of ignore that. Have a plan, you know, anything you want to do, you can do it. You can definitely do it. You just need to have a plan and be proactive at it. Don't, don't wait for things to happen. You make things happen. Don't be out there thinking it's not going to be possible. Anything that you put your mindset, it's possible. I want to thank you for coming out and you know, covering this and uh, putting light on truckers, man. It's not easy. Joining us now is filmmaker Ernesto Cruz Pulido, and your film is called Unsung Heroes. How did you come up with this idea? When did you decide that this is what your subject was going to be for the Big Tell? It was my little brother who gave me the inspiration. Okay. Uh, he's going into his career as a diesel technician. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so he's like this little 19 year, 20 year old kid working on these giant trucks, and he just tells me, he's like, you know what you should do? You should do it on truckers. And I was like, hmm, why? And he's like, <laughs> well, they're always doing all the hardest jobs, they're always out there for us, working for us, and you know, no one really talks about them. The personalities that I was able to interview for my uh, documentary, uh, they came from such diverse backgrounds. Some of them, it ran in their community. Uh -huh. their, all their uncles, all their fathers, everyone was into the trucking community. And for others, it was more so that it was an opportunity um, that they could get onto even though uh, they felt they had they had no more opportunities kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Where they feel like they have to provide for their family and yet there's not quite a lot out there to choose from in terms of uh, career-wise. And um, it just really inspired me because everyone's been there where it's like, what should I do with my life? Now? Yeah. Because I get a sense that a lot of people that are on the road driving, they, um, they, they, they tend to like swear at truckers and be like, oh, get out of my way. I can't believe you're in my way, this or that. And it's like, to me, I always give them the right away because they're, they're heroes to us. They're doing the thing that we all need. Still to come, a look into the people providing care for those with Alzheimer's disease. Now, from the KC24 studios, The Big Tell. 10 short films from 10 Valley filmmakers. Inspiring local stories throughout our valley. Presented by the James B. McClatchy Foundations in partnership with Central Valley Community Foundation and CMAC. This is The Big Tell. The heartfelt stories of caring for those with Alzheimer's disease. This is Invisible Love. What would I do different about the caregiving experience? Actually, I don't know that I would do a whole lot different. My husband, Roger, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2009, and I took care of him for nine years till he passed away in July of 2018. I was a caregiver for my loved one for nine years until he passed away three years ago due to Alzheimer's. I'm taking care of my dad, uh, John. He was diagnosed with early stages Alzheimer. When I recognized that my husband needed help was after a couple of things happened that normally he did really well, all of a sudden became difficult for him. Like he was a general contractor and his in his work he was starting to have difficulty like remembering he'd measure something with his tape measure and then go to cut the wood and go back and have to measure again because he couldn't remember or to read it correctly. So what happened was is he got, went to Walmart, tried to drive back home, lost his way. Ended up in two towns past Merced over into Chowchilla area. He started acting different. By the, what I mean is that he was verbally abusive sometimes or forgetful and he would repeat himself over and over and over. I'd go out to my dad's and oh, see what he's doing right now. If I understand the, the word invisible love, I love my loved one 
unconditional. There was days there were good moments and there was days there were bad moments and I would just walk out of there with tears in my eyes and say, I love you so much if you could only understand. Oh, the biggest surprise for me in my journey was probably how hard it was <laughs> and not being able to do it all myself because you can't sleep through the night. You can't leave him for a minute. I was in at the computer in my den for a f just a very few minutes. I came back, I walked back in the hallway and I smelled gas. And what he had done was, I have a gas stove and he had turned the knob, not to the ignition point, but just enough for gas. And it had, must have been on for two or three minutes. It filled the house. So that day was the day I took all the knobs off the stove. <laughs> <laughs> Self-care to me was something I did not practice. My loved one came first before my husband, my grandchildren, or my children. I didn't know what self-care was. I had to quit my job early to take care of him full-time, and then after a couple of years of that, I realized that I couldn't do the job I wanted to do by myself. I had to get help in the home. And then eventually I had to put him in a care facility where he could have 24 hours of care, not by a tired person like I was becoming. And that's one of the reasons why I like in-home care because I can go out to visit him. If he were in a facility and they had a COVID outbreak or whatever, um, and they'd lock it all down, I can't get in and see my dad. What concerned me most about my husband was the fact that there was no cure and that eventually he was gonna die and that he would forget who we were. My biggest concern was that I was not meeting their needs or our needs. It's, um, I hate to say it, but I'd almost rather him have a heart attack and go than have to endure um, and I think as much as we prepare for the eventual end, we're not going to be prepared. What advice would I give to someone? Um, just take it day by day, step by step. I've had many people tell me, I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you did it. And it's not like you need a superpower. You just need to be willing to take the next step. So joining us now is filmmaker Karina Turner. And your film is called Invisible Love. How did you come upon this story? Why was this the story that you wanted to tell? Because it's my story as well. I, I just didn't want to be in it. But I, <laughs> uh, I had taken care of my, my stepdad for uh -huh. 10 years. He passed away in 2018. And at that point, you know, I had retired from, you know, from my previous work in order to take care of him. Yeah. And when that was all done, I physically couldn't go back to what I did before. So I said, well, what do I do now? Yeah. And the title, Invisible Love, came from, from two aspects. Uh -huh. From my personal aspect, as I was taking care of my stepdad, people would always ask, how's your dad? How's yeah. your dad? How's your dad? And then it became, Karina no longer exists. Uh -huh. I'm just this connection to him. And not that I resented it, but it made it challenging. Uh -huh. I accepted the fact that my stepdad wasn't going to remember me. And that's the other invisible part, mm -hmm. is that you become invisible to the one you're taking care of. Yes. Because they do forget who you are. They don't place you in their, in their memories anymore. Yes. What once was the largest lake of the West now serves another purpose. We we'll take you out in the Thule's after the break. What I love about CMAC. What I love about CMAC. What I love about CMAC is that they provide me with the knowledge. The equipment. The space to express myself. To amplify my voice. To share my story. My story. Mi storia. Kiaku Dunning. My story. Wadakushu. My story. Go to cmac.tv slash my story to learn more.
Now, from the KC24 studios, The Big Tell. 10 short films from 10 Valley filmmakers. Inspiring local stories throughout our valley. Presented by the James B. McClatchy Foundations in partnership with Central Valley Community Foundation and CMAC. This is The Big Tell. Welcome back. Our next film takes us to the South Valley, out in the Tulies. What's more important than water? What's brought more change to this earth than water? What brings more destruction than the absence of water? Here on the shores of the Kings River, water is dumped into a series of canals that run deep into the fields. But this wasn't always the case. 120 years ago, this river and all nearby creeks poured directly into Tulare Lake, the largest lake west of the Mississippi. So where did that lake go? And how did the most important water source in the southwest go from being filled with fresh water to being lost to the sands of time? Let's start at the beginning. Around 750,000 years ago, the entirety of California's Great Central Valley was covered under a large lake. So a key concept to understand about water is that it moves in a cycle. Water evaporates up and then it rains down. Lake Corcoran was a huge part of that cycle here in California. The water evaporated into the air, pouring not only into the Sierra Nevada mountain range, but also into the Mojave and Great Basin deserts, turning the area between Reno and Salt Lake City into a vast grassland. Everything was green. Then it all changed the only way ancient California could change. 600,000 years ago, a massive earthquake ripped a hole, creating the San Francisco Bay. The entirety of Lake Corcoran flowed deep into the valley, creating the San Francisco Bay. As the lake drained, the deepest parts of the lake became three separate but large lakes. Lake Tulare was the largest of the three. When humans arrived around 50,000 years ago, the Tachi tribe settled directly on the shores of Lake Tulare. At the time, one could stand here on the hills of Kettleman City and look east out over the large lake stretching towards the mountains on the horizon. Deer, elk, and antelopes roamed the shores, and in wet years, salmon even roamed throughout the lake, making the area full of food for the Tachi Yokuts and later a very profitable fishing industry for the early American settlers. The lake was so large that even steamships could carry passengers from San Francisco all the way down to Bakersfield on it. Look around! All of this was once underwater. There was fish in the lake, there was rain in the mountains, and even keep the temperature here on the valley pretty cool. So what happened? To encourage settlers, parts of the lake were drained for farmland. After various flooding incidents along the river, more reservoirs were built throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Now most of this was done in moderation, just to keep the flooding down as well as keeping the people safe. The real problem actually came in the 1920s. In 1921, J.G. Boswell founded the Boswell Company growing various crops along the valley. However, his main crop was cotton. The cotton farming demanded so much water that Boswell had to keep draining the lake to grow his company. And to this day, the J.G. Boswell Company is still the largest landowner in all of Southern California, as well as one of the largest cotton producers in the United States. Boswell and early farmers created a booming market. Without the lake, there was plenty of land to grow as many crops as they wanted, and cities like Stratford and Corcoran bloomed out of the dry lake bed. But when you take a link out of the chain, you break the cycle. And when a cycle breaks, there's always negative effects. Average temperatures in the valley have skyrocketed, and larger droughts now haunt the area. Rain is no longer guaranteed, and wells along the foothills of the Sierra Nevada frequently run dry. Everything comes with a price. In a way, it's almost as if we're being punished for what Boswell and the early California settlers did. The lake is literally haunting us, and to add insult to self-inflicted injury, the lake is also pulling us to hell with it. Over the past 100 years, the dry lake bed has sunk over two dozen feet, and the lower we go, the hotter it gets. Nature is very complicated. Nature gets even more complicated when it comes to water. Out in the Tulis is a saying no one uses anymore because the lake that it came from doesn't exist anymore. The saying means beyond far away, and in a sense, it is very fitting now. Once upon a time, Tulare Lake was a cornerstone of the water systems in the San Joaquin Valley. Now, it's simply a memory out in the Tulis. And joining us now is Eric Galan. So your film is called Out in the Tulis. And how'd you come up with the idea? How'd you find it? 
As a person who loves to do research, who loves to just look around things, I was just wandering around online, looking at local, uh, local history in my area, local history in Fresno, local history in Kings County, and I stumbled upon the lake. History is impactful, so you remember certain things that almost happened, you know. Mm -hmm. We remember the time we almost got hit by a car, we remember yeah. the certain small things. You don't think about the things that actually happened in history that left a real impact on you. And one of the big things that left an impact in this area, especially in the South Valley, mm -hmm. is the loss of this lake. Okay. Eric Galan, thank you so much for being here with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. A world of delicious Japanese confectionery delights made in Fresno's 100-year-old family-run store. Next. Now from the KC24 studios, The Big Tell. 10 short films from 10 Valley filmmakers. Inspiring local stories throughout our valley. Presented by the James B. McClatchy Foundations in partnership with Central Valley Community Foundation and CMAC. This is The Big Tell. This next film takes us through the history of one Japanese dessert that has been handmade here in Fresno for a hundred years. Located in Fresno, California, Kogetsudo is a Japanese confectionery shop specializing in manju and mochi, and is over 100 years old. But wait, what is manju and mochi? Manju is the term for a small roundish pastry, first created in China, but adopted in Japan around the 1300s. The outside of manju is made of either flour, rice powder, katsu, or buckwheat, and a filling of anko, red bean paste, or a white bean paste usually made from boiled azuki beans or lima beans and sugar. Mochi is similar to manju, but has a steamed rice flour outside with bean filling. But manju and mochi are sometimes made with other fillings. Kogetsudo in Fresno, California, is one of the few family-owned manju shops in America. All are located on the West Coast. Sugimatsu Ikeda and his wife opened Kogetsudo in 1915 on Kern Street, later moving to its current location on F Street in 1920. Since then, Kogetsudo has been run by Ikeda's sons, Roy and Masao, Masao and his wife Dorothy, and finally by Masao's daughter Lynn and her daughter Emmy. My dad doing the work and just watching him um, make the manju, the, the bean paste, the uncle, um, watching him how he would pound the rice for shogatsu for New Year's. When I was five or six, mom was making the pancakes and she was wrapping them and setting them up and I would fiddle around with it and just like line them up straight in the pile. When I was still in high school, I was learning a little bit of how to make things. When I finished college, that's when I really got into it, learning how to make the anko and the, the yokan. During World War II, when the Ikeda family was interned at Jerome, Arkansas, Mr. Ikeda made manju for the internees. From what I understand through my dad's friends, when um, my grandfather would go in the kitchen, he would ask everybody to leave, and then he would make the manju for the people in the camp. I never knew that until someone told me, but he made sure that everybody would leave that he was the only person in there. That's how he kept the secret. During the weddings, there's the special ones, the Osunaya. Um, the males will get the white one with the brown circle. The females will have the pink one. 
and we would put a brown circle on, make a brown circle on that one. So that would go into the altar for the male and female. For funerals, it would be the Osunaya, which is the white with a brown circle. During uh, New Year's Shogatsu, it would be the Komochi, the pound of sweet rice. And then we would put beans in it, either the whole beans or smooth beans, whichever they prefer. Probably my fondest memory is when she had to make pastries for the Obon festival over at the Buddhist temple. Me and my friend, we would go over there and help out and we would dance. And then sometimes we would have to like run back over here and grab whatever she needs and then run back all the way over to the Buddhist temple. I was five and I wasn't supposed to play with, like touch any of the product. One day I just like poked one of the green Manjus, and since I made a hole, she's been doing that ever since. When I was growing up, like in high school, I didn't want the business to just stop at my dad. I wanted to continue on, so I made a decision, like probably the first year in college, to carry it on. Come discover and enjoy the ancient tradition of these delicious and artful jewels handmade in Fresno's 100-year-old manju store, Kugetsudo. So joining us now is filmmaker Edward Goto. How did you land on telling this story? I didn't think there were very many Japanese-American stories in the big tale. Yeah. I don't think. And uh, so I thought this is a really classic one, and it's not just a historical story, it's also something that's still going on today. I had to think about the setups. Uh, my first shot was just sort of a rotating pastry on a dish here and I thought oh wow this is not going to cut it. So I had to like really think about the setups and backgrounds, foregrounds and things like that. You know. Up next we dive into the vibrant community of Argentine tango. We'll be right back. Now, from the KC24 Studios, The Big Tell, 10 short films from 10 Valley filmmakers. Inspiring local stories throughout our valley. Presented by the James B. McClatchy Foundations in partnership with Central Valley Community Foundation and CMAC. This is The Big Tell. It takes two to tango in this vibrant Central Valley community, a peek into the art of Argentine tango. connection. It's like a connection between two bodies, two hearts, and two minds with the music. It's like a silent language. And you never know who you're going to connect with. That's the magic of it. It's different than any other kind of dance. You don't have to speak the same language. It takes me completely out of myself. And when I go home, my feet are tired, but I'm relaxed. And for uh, two or three hours, I'm just, I don't know, flying free is the only way I can describe it. There are moments when you're dancing when you're so connected to the music and to the leader that it's just, oh, that's what this is all about. I don't think that tango is any different than any other relationship. For three minutes you have to share yourself in order to get to that point where you can fly and feel free. You know, our last milonga, which was last Sunday, we had just so many people here. We were just overrun by people that were just enjoying the music and the dance. And it is growing. We usually travel out of town to partake of their of their groups, but now things are starting to come here. 
Well, I'm, I'm definitely determined to put Fresno on the map. There was one week when we danced tango three times in a week, and I thought that was just amazing to do in Fresno. We're so fortunate because this is a very small community. You know, San Francisco and LA, they've got huge tango community. And then along comes Marcelo, also Argentine, national champion in Fresno. We just enjoy each other. My goal is on trying to create more events, more tango events, and of course attracting more people to tango. Oh, I love that it's growing. I just love that it's growing. We have new people, we have excellent instructors. We are just blessed beyond blessed with the community that we have here, and it's growing, and that's the most important thing right there. I think that's really fortunate and I'm happy that the community is responding to that being available to us here. There's other cities around us that struggle to even get enough people to do a class. We really enjoy the dancing but the people. It's good people in this community of the tangle. It's meeting people, coming, getting together. So I thought a good incentive for this outreach is to have a course on Argentine tango for the rest of us, which means it is social tango. It is not the kind of virtuosic tango that you see on TV shows, which is all choreographed and rehearsed. And Argentine tango is not that. It's only $20 per semester. You can't lose much, but the gains could be tremendous. If you haven't tried tango, you've got to at least give it a try sometime. It's a different experience than you'll experience in any other kind of dance. Once you're hooked, you're hooked. I will tell you that for sure. It, it just grabs at you and holds you here and you just can't, you just have to dance it. Joining us now is filmmaker Melanie Bisset. How did you come up with this idea? So originally I started with the idea of um, reviving tango after the pandemic because they couldn't dance for two years. And for these people who love dancing, it was hard. But through the interviews, I realized that there was more to the story and um, the pandemic wasn't really like the core of the story. To, so I've shifted the focus to being um, that people just don't know about um, what Fresno has to offer. I. I learned to dance tango in college and I was just looking for a place to dance in Fresno and I found them and um, it's been fun. This next film delivers a candid representation of what it means to be a non-acknowledged tribe. We'll be right back. Now, from the KC24 studios, The Big Tell. Ten short films from ten Valley filmmakers. Inspiring local stories throughout our valley. Presented by the James B. McClatchy Foundations in partnership with Central Valley Community Foundation and CMAC. This is The Big Tell. An educational representation of what it means to be a non-recognized tribe in the Central Valley. This is non-acknowledged. Imagine waiting 170 years for the government to acknowledge your existence. 
I'm Roman Raintree, and I'm Dunlop Band of Mono, Choi Numni, and Wok Chumni. Ever since I was a child, my mother told me that we as a people would never be federally acknowledged as long as the name of our ancestral homeland um, was a pejorative. Uh, my mother passed away in 2013, and then I realized that it had been 160 years since our treaties had been broken with America. As my mother had said, if you can get them to understand and respect us as a human being and no longer a pejorative, then maybe they just might acknowledge us as a tribal people. That's when I decided to change the name. I didn't know where to start, so I did some research and I learned that I needed to start with my board of supervisors. I went to Nathan Maxick's office and unfortunately he wasn't able to meet with me, but his staff member uh, articulated to me a roadmap to renaming our ancestral homelands, that community. And that was to get a petition, propose a new name, and host a community meeting. So I started a change.org petition that to date has over 36,000 signatures. I went to Orange Cove, because they're the largest incorporated community that neighbors S Valley, Fresno County, and they supported me. Prior to the meeting, Magsig and Mayor Lopez got together and decided that they were gonna table any promised uh, support for my resolution. He Made the Max say, call me a liar, saying I never even spoke to one of his staff members in July of 2020. So I went to the next Board of Supervisor meeting to get it on record that my resolution and that I want our ancestral homelands to be renamed. He didn't do anything. We went to their office multiple times over the year, and then in November the residents asked me to come. Um, they felt ignored. Uh, just as the Native American community felt ignored. So I wanted to support them, and I did go. And then what happened? And then they threw me out. Well, unbeknownst to me, Secretary Holland would announce that the S word would be now regarded as offensive by America, and that she would begin the removal of the S word from all federal lands. And then a few months later, Assemblymember James Ramos would introduce Assembly Bill 2022 to begin the removal of that word here in California. In August, AB 2022 was sent to Governor Gavin Newsom's desk. He was expected to sign it the following month on California Indian Day. When the governor signed AB 2022 into law, what that meant for me was that no longer will people think that word is acceptable to call indigenous women. No longer will travelers from all over the world come and visit Kings Canyon National Park and pass through our homeland and through our community and take back home to China, to New Zealand, to wherever they're coming from to visit and think that's acceptable to call us that. What it meant for me was that it was one step closer to federal acknowledgement. If my parents were alive today, I believe they would be happy and proud of me. Now that he signed it, I hope Governor Newsom creates a formal process that acknowledges all non-federally acknowledged tribes within California's borders. It's been 107 years since America broke its treaties with not only my people, but an estimated 119 tribes in California. I hope that we don't have to wait 171 years for acknowledgement. Hey, hey. So joining us now is writer and director Raika L. Raintree. So tell me how this idea came to you and how you met your subject matter. I'm married to him. Oh. <laughs> so he was um, working on renaming um, what's formerly known as Squaw Valley. Uh -huh. And um, I said, you know what, this is a really good story. It'd be great if it was a documentary. Yeah. And then just out of nowhere, we got an email saying, hey, there's a, a competition, you should enter it. So we just kind of want to pique people's interest and have them kind of research more about local tribes in the area. The story of minorities through music and art. We continue our Big Tell Showcase after this. Now, from the KC24 studios, The Big Tell. Ten short films from ten Valley filmmakers. Inspiring local stories throughout our Valley. Presented by the James B. McClatchy Foundations in partnership with Central Valley Community Foundation and CMAC. This is The Big Tell. 
We conclude the Big Tell showcase with an uplifting story teaching history through the art of music. I remember sitting in the back of the class like what's she talking about? Teachers saying close all your mouths. Ain't no talking that. I'm talking about worksheet after worksheet. She know my name, but she don't know me. This is boring and it's easy, so I'm speaking to the homies. And the teacher kicked me out of the class. Look, I got home, mama whooping me fast. I used to think the teacher crazy, but now I know that she was lazy. I'm an 80s baby. You know what these kids are facing? Complacency. They got attitudes. They angry all up in class, but I ain't mad at you. And that's the reason Schoolyard Rap is here to rap to you. So if you're loving what we're doing, show some gratitude. Because they said I had ADD. That ain't add up. Because any book I read that interests me, look, I was masked up. Teacher said I was a diamond, but I was a tad rough. Said I need some shining, bruh. I was gassed up. He said I had potential to do this or to do that. But potential don't mean jack without a mentor on your back or your mental game intact. So many little things distract. So I'm reaching kids' potentials through these tracks. Schoolyard rap. School should be fun. That's why I'm here. Schoolyard rap is here for one reason, education through entertainment. We take mundane, normal, boring subjects, we spice it up. We make it fun, and more importantly, we provide entertaining concerts and performances that bring the whole student population and the school to life. Everybody say, I am amazing. amazing. So I'm a teacher in this class and, and my students saying yes sir, no sir, it's sitting down, be quiet, it's very order regimented, right? And they respect me and you know we're doing work but there's no joy at any point in the classroom for the most part, there's nothing. I was teaching how I thought I should teach, how I was taught, sit down, be quiet, worksheet after worksheet. So one day we're in the cafeteria and one of the students, his name was Kendall, uh, his name is Kendall, pardon me, and Kendall he says, Mr. Brown, listen to this. And he plays a song for me and I'm listening to it. Now, I literally told him, I was like, Kendall, this song is trash. It's basura, garbage. And he said, in front of everybody, Mr. Brown, I bet you can't do better. And everybody's like, ooh. So I say, challenge accepted, right? Over that weekend, I made a song. Now, we're teaching about the Stamp Act, the Quartering Act. And it was like, Stamp Act, that's that thing I don't like. Uh, quartering Act, that's that thing I don't like. And so I made that song for his class specifically. I took it to his class, I played it for him, and they loved it. And their test scores that week were higher. So I went there and I, I made another song the next week, and I gave it to all the students. I made a song for seventh grade and a song for eighth grade. And they all loved it and their, all their test scores were up in the previous week. So I changed my pedagogical style in those moments to reach students where they are. That's really what School Yard Rap's about. It's firstly about making experiences through this learning process, making it fun, making it engaging. But secondly, the content that we teach is just as important. Our students need to see themselves in history. You can teach about science, technology, engineering, and math while teaching simultaneously about black history. Oftentimes, what is engaging is us, what looks like us, what we can relate to, what we can see ourselves as. And we often omit that in education and specifically in the realm of history, we omit the voices, the appearances, the representation of women and people of color. What was your favorite part of the show? And I'll sing, do you remember one of the songs that you like? What song was your favorite? Excellent. You hear comments like, man, thank you, I've never learned that, or I wish I would've known that when I was a kid, or this is what we should've known from adults of all different races. And from the kids, you just see joy. And to be able to make somebody feel and see visibly the pride and joy that they have, because you're telling them that they are amazing and that their culture is relevant and important, and that's the best feeling in the world, man. It's one of the best feelings in the world you leave those moments with this huge sense of connectivity 
Who made the pyramid stand? Us. Who made mathematic equations with fractions and angles before? So joining us now is filmmaker Jeremy Miller. You found this company. You found this story. There really is more to storytelling. So how did you do that part of it? Um, well, just understanding the need of history being taught um, and being inclusive uh -huh. right? and, and appealing to different audiences and learning how to tell a story um, with empathy yeah. and with, you know, in, in encouraging ways and in intriguing ways. Um, I just knew he was the fit. Yeah. I, I didn't really have this like, okay, this is exactly what the story is going to be. Uh -huh. I just knew he was the person. Once I got an interview with him, it all just fell into yeah. place. Really, um, it just gives people who might not have stumbled across it or people who haven't heard about it an opportunity to just check it out. Yeah. Uh, see if it's something that uh, inspires them or just see if it's something that they think they should support. So joining us now is Ashley Swearingen, former mayor of Fresno and CEO of the Central Valley Community Foundation. So you guys have a big part in the Big Tell, and so you guys are a sponsor this year, but you guys have been putting it on and been a part of it for a long time. How long has the Big Tell been happening? This is our sixth year. Uh, I can't believe it. We started in 2017, so this marks the sixth year. That means after the showcase, we'll have 60 of these films. They're up on the website, bigtell.org. Um, and it's just been like such a delight to yeah. see all the different threads of the Central Valley fabric come together through the Big Tell. I think that's the perfect word to describe the sort of library that you guys are creating in this um, sort of like quilt of all of these stories. Why is storytelling so important to a community? It, it touches so many aspects of our community. I, I, when we first started this at the Central Valley Community Foundation, um, our intent was to represent stories of the Central Valley to people who live in the Central Valley. So our focus is on the people who live here. We're not trying to like broadcast a message yeah. about the valley outside the region. We just find so often there are so many things that people don't know about their own, their own place where they live. And so um, we thought if we could empower regional filmmakers to find these obscure stories, you would say, like, oh, I never knew that happened in the Central Valley or that that was a part of our culture here. It's just really about reacquainting people with this region. And in doing so, we think it just fills people's lungs with like sort of the hope and excitement of the place where they live. And so it's very much about building the esteem of the, the region and putting a spotlight on things that maybe get overlooked if we don't do the big tell. These 10 filmmakers received a one-on-one -on -one mentorship with Emmy-nominated documentarian Sasha Brown Rice, and she joins us now as the mentor and consulting producer for the Big Tell Filmmakers. So thank you so much for being here. We, uh, I'm so glad to see you again this year with the Big Tell. What does it mean to you as a documentarian, as a lover of stories, to be a mentor to these filmmakers? Well... Being a mentor to the Big Tell filmmakers is like no other experience. Often people think that I'm the one uh, giving, but so much of it is about me receiving. From some of the filmmakers who really had zero filmmaking experience, they knocked it out of the park. Their ability to just tell the story, to really stay with the heart of what's driving uh, their story has been amazing. I am so impressed by the work that comes out of the Big Tell. They're great ways to tell stories and they just, they really stick with you. So thank you so much for mentoring our local storytellers and, you know, helping them create these stories and, and get them out to people. We really appreciate it. Sasha, thank you. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be a part of this initiative. And there's no shortage of talent in the Central Valley. Every year, I'm just blown away by the amazing stories. And, you know, this year again, we topped record submissions. And uh, so keep it coming. Thank you all for tuning in to the 2022 Big Tell Showcase. If you have a Central Valley story that you want to tell, you can submit your idea for the Big Tell Showcase in 2023. Thank you all so much for watching. We'll see you next year.